Without further ado, let's start with uh, case number one. It's a 57-year-old female with a lower leg uh, lesion. Let's see here, this is the lowest we can, lowest power we can get. All right, so we have our epidermis there, and then underneath we see a very cellular. I'll turn it around so it's right side up. It's kind of hard to do upside down. There you go. Um, that feels better. Uh, spindle cell uh, lesion um, that appears to have collagen trapping at the edges of it. Yeah, there is kind of collagen. The, the thick reticular dermal collagen bundles, these bright pink guys here, are getting kind of, yeah, getting kind of wrapped around by these spindle cells. You can see the spindle cells stretching out here. I'm doing hand motions, but you can't see them if you're watching the video, so. It's a bad habit I picked up, I guess. And then, yeah, you can see a little bit of the entrapment at the edges. So it's not very circumscribed, is it? It kind of, like in this area, kind of feathers and trickles out. Right. At the bottom, a little bit more circumscribed, but still you can see there's a little bit of incorporation of that dermal collagen, that bright, those bright pink bundles kind of trapped up into the tumor. Okay. And what else? And when I was looking at the cellular component, I was looking to see if there's any mitosis, um, necrosis. Uh, it's very bland all through here. Like your eye doesn't really get. Yeah, you're not seeing wild pleomorphism right. or anything, right? Yeah, no, no dramatic atypia, right. right? It's kind of bland, slightly plump spindle cells, kind of plump, you know, fat, juicy-looking spindle cells. All right. So, what did you, uh, what did you think about here? What was your differential? Uh, so. With some of the things I saw, I thought this was possibly a dermatofibroma, uh, like a cellular one. Um, then, of course, also with the, if you're thinking it's a DFSP, which I don't think it is, because we're not invading into the fat, we're not entrapping fat, we're not going into that direction like that. Um, the bottom is pretty... Um, somewhat circumscribed. Yeah, it looks like it. We can't really see, but it looks like it's starting to kind of uh, trickle away, right? Like right. it's the cellular stuff is stopping. You know, you never can be sure, but yeah, you get the feeling that probably the majority of the mass has been removed by this. Yeah, good. So that is kind of the main differential that people come up with often for spindle things like this. Um, and yeah, this is actually a cellular dermatofibroma. Good, good job. And the other name you could use for this is a cellular fibrous histiocytoma or benign fibrous histiocytoma, which is like a synonym for dermatofibroma. And when to call them cellular is a matter of some debate and is, is quite subjective, I think. But the way that, the way that I tried to learn it from Dr. Weiss is she really liked to see, and again, I hope I'm not misquoting her. This is my interpretation of what she taught me as a fellow, you know, 10 years ago. So, so take it with a grain of salt. But the way I do it now and the way I tried to interpret it from her is that usually the thing that you want to see in cellular DF is not just hypercellularity, but actual like long fascicles that are intersecting together. And this is, I think this is a pretty good example because it's got quite a bit of very like very streamy fascicles of spindle cells, right? See how they're all kind of running together, you know, in parallel here, but they're not like, they're not like the 90 degree fascicles of smooth muscle. They're like fascicles kind of like you would see in things that have a, a, almost like a bit of a herringbone pattern, kind of a got to hallucinate a little bit to get that. Um, you can see atypia in DFs and sometimes really big like scattered pleomorphic cells. They're called monster cells. It's a benign finding. You can see mitoses. In fact, I'd say you usually will see mitoses and sometimes it can be quite a few of them. I saw one around here a minute ago and I was trying to find it now, but it was from low power. I saw it. How did I, how did I miss it? Well, there, there, it's, it's totally common to have mitosis. So, and in fact, if you're between DF and DFSP, finding some scattered atypia and kind of bigger cells and mitosis actually kind of more in favor of dermatofibroma, paradoxically, rather than dermatofibrous sarcoma protuberans, DFSP is usually very bland because it's a translocation sarcoma, has these very thin stretched out cells. And like you said, you want to see really prominent fat entrapment. DF sometimes can get down in the fat, but the way they interact with fat is different. We don't really have an example here to show. The other thing that is useful for dermatofibromas, and none of these rules are perfect. The collagen trapping is great, but I will say that collagen trapping can be seen in DFSP sometimes and in other things too. So it usually is present in dermatofibroma, but it's not a specific finding. One thing that is 
somewhat specific, not totally, is this what the epidermis does. The epidermis over a dermatofibroma tends to get elongated, reedy ridges, so it gets acanthosis. The, the basal layer often picks up extra melanin pigment, and that's a, a, an explanation for why a lot of times dermatofibromas are kind of brown. They're kind of firm brown papules. They um, Clinically, I feel like oftentimes people will recognize them, dermatologists will clinically, but also sometimes the differential that they have on there is basal cell carcinoma, or maybe nevus even. Sometimes they think that they're nevi because they're so pigmented. And the pigment is basically, these are not melanocytes, this is just increased melanin pigment in the basal keratinocytes. And uh, this one doesn't really show it, but sometimes the epidermis, when it comes down, it gets real flattened at the bottom, and we call that tabling. And that's a really good feature for, for the epidermal hyperplasia that happens over dermatofibromas. When a DF gets kind of rubbed and irritated, it will push right up to the epidermis and you'll get kind of flattening or atrophy of the reedy ridges. And in fact, people often teach that you have a Gren zone in DF. It's one of those things that are always supposed to have a Gren zone. It has a little zone of normal stuff that separates it. But I see all the time where this happens, particularly in excoriated scratch DFs. I feel like I see it more where the DF just pushes right up and starts to squish the overlying epidermis and makes it very flat and sometimes thin. And it can even ulcerate out if it's been picked out a lot. Let's see if there's any better tabling over here. No, no good tabling, but there is epidermal hyperplasia. And occasionally, too, you can get basaloid stuff that looks almost like little basal cell carcinoma, and that's called follicular induction. It's basically hair follicle overgrowth that's being induced. The tumor is somehow making the hair, little hair follicle buds start to grow from the epidermis. So if you ever think you see a basal cell carcinoma over top of a DF, it's probably not a basal cell carcinoma. I have seen a couple basal cells over DFs, like true definitive looking basal cells. But usually for practical purposes and for testing purposes, looks like a basal over a DF, uh -uh. it's just induction of the hair follicles. So I think this stuff fits really nicely for cellular DFs. Cellular DFs can, uh, are reported to have a higher risk of local recurrence. And I think the, my view on that is that probably most of the time it's not because they're growing aggressively. It's because a lot of times they're big and deep and they go deep down into the skin, sometimes even to the subcutis. And oftentimes they'll get a shave biopsy. So of course, if you like just, you're taking the tip of the iceberg off, the thing's gonna keep growing. And so it's not really recurring as much as it is, it is just persisting and continuing to grow. Um, anecdotally, if you remove most of the lesion, even if margins are positive, a lot of times these won't come back. But I have seen a few that did kind of locally aggressively grow back. And there are exceedingly rare reports of metastases from dermatofibromas. When dermatofibromas metastasize, it's usually the cellular or the aneurysmal type, the big, large, deeper ones. That said, I don't go putting in my report, oh, these are known to metastasize because it's super rare. Basal cells can metastasize too, but I don't put that in every report. Metastatic risk has been reported in, you know, one in 100,000 cases or something. So um, I, I feel like some people get really worked up over that, but I think it's so rare that it is not, you know, not really worth bringing up personally. It's just like one of those super rare case report things. And um, there is a, you know, Chris Fletcher has a series about them if you want to read more about that. So, so anyway, a nice example of cellular dermatofibroma. And people often ask, you know, is this cellular DF or regular DF? Is that cellular? Well, it's, it is subjective, but to me, this is an example of cellular. When you get those nice kind of sweeping fascicles in there, that's good cellular uh, dermatofibroma. And this one doesn't have it, but if you see foam cells, Teuton giant cells, hemosiderin, blood-filled spaces, those are all really strong clues towards dermatofibroma, not DFSP. So those, when they're present, those are all really helpful features that are often seen in DF, but not usually in DFSP. So there you go. And if you were having trouble, what stain could you do? If, you, if I told you you could have one stain only, you know, I'm cruel, a cruel taskmaster, and I won't let you have multiple stains. Only one stain. What would you want to do for DF versus DFSP? That's CD34. Yes, good answer. CD34 is the one that I like better because it's very, very sensitive for DFSP and is usually negative in DF. But I will say, and I've got a video on, and I guess I need to make a separate video just about this, but I have a video about aneurysmal DF on my YouTube channel. And in that video, there's an image, a nice example of what CD34 does in a big dermatofibroma. And it's important to know about because everyone learns they're negative for 34. And that's true in the middle of the lesion. But out here around the periphery, around this outside of the lesion, you often get strong staining at the very edge. And that's because the normal dermis is CD34 positive. There's these dendritic cells that live in the dermis that are 34 positive. And the DF pushes them away, but at the edge, they get kind of, kind of clumped up around the edge. This is my way I conceptualize it. I don't know if that's actually what's happening you know, at a cell biology level, but I don't care. The story works, so I'm going to use it. 
And so what you do is get this halo of CD34 bright staining around the edge. But if you look in the middle, it'll be dead negative. Whereas a DFSP is usually going to be solid, diffuse positive for 34, very strong, um, with the exception of like the higher grade fiber sarcomatous DFSPs, they can lose 34 sometimes. So normally 34 is enough to, to solve the problem as long as you know to not fall for that pitfall of worrying about extra staining at the periphery. And normal dermis is usually CD34 positive. Look the next time you see a control, 34 normally stains quite a bit in the dermis. So that's the normal um, normal pattern. Yes, factor 13A will highlight a lot of cells in these, but I've seen DFSPs with scattered factor 13A cells in them. I find that stain not very useful. And in fact, for spindle cell tumors, I personally never use factor 13A. I know some people do and like it, but I just have not found it to be useful, so I don't use it. So um, there you go. Now we've, we've beaten it to death, but it's an important thing because it comes up a lot. Um, I often will add a little comment, especially if it's a partial biopsy, that because these go deeper in the dermis, they do have somewhat higher risk of local recurrence, and then they can decide if they want to do conservative excision or just follow the patient. But I personally believe it's up between the patient and the treating physician. So.